everyone. Bonjour, bonjour. Thank you so much for joining us virtually today for the 16th annual York Gardner Lecture. I want to begin by acknowledging the land that we are on here today. As this event is virtual and we are not all gathered in the same space, I recognize that this land acknowledgement might not be for the territory that you are currently on. We ask that if this is the case, that you take the responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory you are on and the current treaty holders. As a member of the York University community, I recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of the university. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Taparanto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Metis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. York University is proud to be amongst the 22 universities nationwide hosting a National Gardner Lecture. And I do just wanna take a moment to acknowledge Professor Ron Perlman at York for his longstanding commitment to supporting York's active engagement in the Gardner Foundation National Program. Each Gardner lecture held across the country gives us as scholars, researchers, students, and Canadians, the opportunity to hear from a Canada Gardner Awards laureate and another expert in their field who are profoundly improving the health and healthcare outcomes of global populations to the discovery, the application, and the translation of biomedical and global health research. For more than 62 years, the Gardner Foundation has recognized distinguished researchers and scholars who have demonstrated extraordinary scientific excellence and leadership in advancing fundamental research in human health that impacts patients and populations around the world. In fact, since 1959, when the first Gardner Awards were granted, approximately 400 scientists have received a Canada Gardner Award, and nearly 100 have gone on to be Nobel laureates, including this year's winner of the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, Dr. David Julius, who we had the honor of hosting here at York as part of the 2017 Gardner National Program. Today, we are honored to welcome our two esteemed speakers, Dr. Jens Saul Holst and Dr. Patricia J. Garcia. Dr. Holst, alongside collaborators, Drs. Daniel Drucker and Joel Hebner, received the 2021 Canada International Gardner Award for their collaborative research on glucagon-like peptides which has led to major advances in the treatment of type two diabetes, obesity, and intestinal disorders. And we mark the centennial celebration of the first major breakthrough in diabetes research, the discovery of insulin, a discovery made right here in Toronto. Dr. Hulse's research serves to advance the scientific journey that has revolutionized treatments for type two diabetes. Dr. Garcia is recognized as a leader in global health, as a member of the Senior Technical Advisor Group of the Reproductive Health Department at the World Health Organization and chair of the WHO's HPV Expert Advisory Group. She is actively involved in research and training on STI, HIV, global research, global health, HPV, and medical informatics. We are honored to have both Dr. Holst and Dr. Garcia join us for the York Gardner Lecture. Before we begin today's programming, we would like to share a video message from Gardner Foundation President and Scientific Director, Dr. Janet Rossant.
Hello, and welcome to today's Gairdner National Lecture. I'm Janet Rossend, President and Scientific Director of the Gairdner Foundation. At Gairdner, we're best known for the prestigious Canada Gairdner Awards, which we've been awarding for over 60 years. 395 awards have been made, 97 laureates have gone on to receive the Nobel Prize, including this year with Dr. David Julius. We're delighted to be able to bring our laureates to speak at universities across the country, where they inspire us all to greater heights in our own research. Our laureates this year have made discoveries that have had an impact on millions of lives around the world, from diabetes to breast and ovarian cancer to zoonotic diseases. The reach of their research is truly global. Your Gairdner National Lecture today is part of a series of virtual events happening from coast to coast as part of Gairdner Science Week. Please visit our website at gairdner.org or check out our social channels at Gairdner Awards to see the full schedule and register to be part of an exciting week of outstanding science. I'd like to thank our sponsors, the Government of Canada, CIHR, the governments of Quebec and Alberta, and the Globe and Mail for their ongoing support of our programs, as well as other sponsors listed on our website. Their support makes events like this possible. I hope you enjoy today's talk and that you'll join us for all the other fantastic programming that Gairdner Science Week has to offer. Thanks and enjoy. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Jennifer Steves, Professor in York's Department of Psychology, Faculty of Health, to introduce our guest lecturers. Thank you, President Lenton. I am delighted to welcome you today to the York Gairdner Lectures. Today's lecture at York University is part of the Gairdner National Program, and we are pleased to have the opportunity to partner for this exciting program. The Gairdner Foundation is a Canadian nonprofit organization that was founded in 1959 by James Arthur Gairdner. The Gairdner Awards recognize and reward the world's most creative and accomplished biomedical scientists who are advancing humanity and the world. Annually, seven awards are given. Five Canada Gairdner International Awards for Biomedical and Health Science Research the John Dirks Canada Gairdner Global Health Award, specifically for impact on global health issues, and the Canada Gairdner Whiteman Award, reserved for a Canadian scientist showcasing scientific excellence and leadership. Laureates each receive $100,000 Canadian that can be put towards anything the laureate wishes. These are Canada's most prestigious awards in biomedical and health sciences and rank among the most prestigious scientific awards in the world. The Gairdner Awards are unique in many ways, including the national program that we are part of today. It brings present and past award laureates and panel members to speak about their award-winning science at venues across the country. And again, this year, of course, everything is virtual. I would like to welcome two distinguished guests attending this morning's lectures. Dr. John Dirks, namesake of the John Dirks Canada Gairdner Global Health Award, and Deborah Gordon L. Bibetti, President of Research Canada. Before I introduce today's first speaker, I would like to mention that next week, from October 25th to the 28th, there are a number of virtual events that you may be interested in that are part of Gairdner Science Week. Please take a look at the Gairdner website for details and registration. For today's lecture, we have two speakers and we would ask that you pose your questions using the Q&A function of Zoom at the bottom of your screen at any time. At the end of the sec second lecture, we will hold our question and answer period, which will be moderated by University Professor Ron Perlman. And now to today's first speaker and recipient of the Canada Gairdner International Award, together with Dr. Joel Francis Habner 
and the Canadian scientist, Dr. Daniel J. Drucker of the Lunenfeld Tannenbaum Research Institute at Mount Sinai Hospital and the University of Toronto. Dr. Jens Yule Holst is professor in the Department of Biomedical Sciences and group leader at the Novo Nordisk Foundation Center for Basic Metabolic Research and the Faculty of Health and Medical Sciences at the University of Copenhagen. Dr. Holst's independent and collaborative research with Dr. Druckers and Havener on glucagon-like peptides has led to major advances in the treatment of type 2 diabetes, obesity, and intestinal disorders. They discovered hormones called glucagon-like peptides, GLP-1 and 2, which control the levels of insulin and glucagon, which work together to maintain healthy sugar levels. They elucidated their biology and physiological function and played critical roles in the design and testing of therapies informed by their initial and subsequent discoveries. Together, Drs. Drucker, Hapner, and Holst have made major contributions to endocrinology and have changed the treatment of metabolic and gastrointestinal diseases. Their work is both basic and translational, a true example of bench to bedside research. The title of Dr. Hulse's talk this morning is Exploration and Pharmacological Potential of the Incretin System in Humans. Dr. Hulse. So hello everybody, um, I hope you can hear me all right. Um, my name is Jens Juhlholz, I'm coming from Copenhagen, uh, from Denmark, from the University of Copenhagen, and I'm extremely pleased to be here today to talk about uh, the work we have been doing on the incretin hormones and tell you a little bit about uh, how we got to discover the GLP-1 uh, peptide in the, in, in many years ago now and how it has been possible to translate this into uh, diabetes medicine. And I'm concentrating on uh, human systems uh, because this is what we've been doing the most, uh, whereas Dan Drucker has been working in many rodents uh, studies. So uh, this will be mainly with a human uh, view. Uh, so um, what I will be talking about is um, exploration of this. And let's move on to the first slide. What we're talking about is the incretin effect. And as you can see here on this slide, the incretin effect is the amplification of insulin secretion that is observed if you take something food by the mouth rather than infusions intravenously. And in principle, this was done with glucose as you can see here. So the point is that you give a dose of glucose and this will cause a rise in, glu in, in, in glucose concentrations in the blood. And that will then result in a certain insulin response. But if you take it by the mouth, uh, the insulin response will be much larger. And as you can see here, it's up to 70%. Uh, of the response that is due to this incretin effect. So let me show you a little bit about the power of the incretin effect. And uh, I think these experiments show this in a beautiful way. I just have to move this. So um, here are experiments where people are given 25 grams of glucose or 50 grams of glucose or 100 grams of glucose. And the glucose concentrations have been measured as you can see here. And then this, these glucose concentrations have been copied with intravenous infusions. And this was done by Michael Mauck and he did it very well, as you can see, uh, they're very uh, completely overlap between the concentration curves. And if you look at the amount of glucose that, that was required for infusion, you can see it up here. So the, thing, the first thing we notice when looking at these curves is that they're virtually identical in spite of the fact that 25 grams of glucose was given here, 50 here and 100 here, they're nevertheless almost identical. And sure enough, it also took about 20 grams to copy the oral curve here in this experiment, and about 20 grams to copy this experiment here, and about 20 grams to copy uh, the 100 gram curve here over here. 
So how is that possible that the body is able to take care of 80% of the glucose you take in orally by some mechanism that then removes it from the circulation? And that's important, of course, because if you let the glucose around, you'll have all sorts of problems. So the reason is, the explanation is, of course, increases in insulin secretion. And you can see them here. Uh, with 25 grams, there's a small res insulin response. With 50 grams, there's a much bigger. And with 100 grams, there's a very large insulin response. So why is that? Why do we have this insulin secretion? And uh, back in 1973, Canadian workers, John Dupre and John Brown, uh, worked with a new hormone that was discovered, which was called gastric inhibitory polypeptide. Uh, it was later renamed glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide. And they showed that in people, if they injected this new hormone, uh, they had a much larger insulin response in spite of lower glucose concentrations than in the control experiment. So uh, this was really something that could stimulate insulin secretion. But we knew that this could not uh, be the only incretin hormone. And that's because in studies that we and others did, immunoneutralizations against this new hormone GIP could not remove all the incretin activity. And for us, the most important was that if we looked at patients with intestinal resections, the incretin effect did not correlate with GIP but with the lengths of distal small intestine remaining, suggesting that something came from the small intestine, the distal small intestine, that was more important. And in addition, we found out that porcine GIP was inactive in type 2 diabetes patients, which was very disappointing, of course, but that's an, a different story. So what we looked at instead was these cells from the gut. Um, and these were cells that are stained, the endocrine cells here, stained with an antiserum against glucagon. And this was, of course, very strange because there's not supposed to be glucagon in the gut. And nevertheless, we had these cells lightening up there. So um, this was, of course, interesting. And um, uh, my mentor, Lisa Heating, uh, was working in those days. We're back in 1971, as you can see, with uh, antibodies against glucagon. And she found that when she applied them in a kind of radioimmunoassay technique, some antibodies would react with extracts from the gut this one, for instance, but others would not react with extracts from the gut, this one over here. And uh, so there were some that were specific for glucagon from the pancreas here, and some that were cross-reacting with the substance from the gut. And if they were used in the radioimmunoassay, as I told you, then we would have completely different results. So here is an oral glucose tolerance test in people. And uh, with one assay, the cross-reacting assay, you would have a large increase, as you can see here. With the other one, the one that was specific for the pancreatic glucagon, there would be a decrease instead. So we had something completely different here coming from the gut. And we put, we put forward this hypothesis here that this gut glucagon, as we called it, could be a pathogenetic factor in reactive hypoglycemia. I was working in the Department of Surgery, Surgical Gastroenterology, and we had these patients that developed um, postprandial hypoglycemia. And we could see here we have the insulin response. It was clearly driven by insulin, but we also had a very exaggerated secretion of this gut material. So we felt that this could be the factor that was responsible for the hypoglycemia. And that, of course, was extremely interesting. So we went for it. And um, by 1983, the, the research from us and from other workers, uh, for instance, Alex the Moody here, had brought us to know the explanation for this immunoreactivity in the gut that had glucagon, uh, that was like glucagon. And this was due to a molecule called glycentin. And glycentin is a molecule of 69 amino acids, and it has the entire glucagon sequence in the middle here. That's where it is. So that was the explanation. But there was also another form of, of this molecule in the gut extracts. And that was a short form here where glucagon is here. And then there is a C-terminal extension of the molecule. And uh, we call them, call these forms various strange things that I've forgotten now, but one name has stuck to this peptide. It's the name oxintomodulin. Oxintomodulin was very interesting 
because oxygen centromodulate could actually stimulate insulin secretion. And this was in studies of an isolated perfused pancreas that we were looking at here uh, back in the time. But uh, it was a, a strange peptide because it also stimulated glucagon secretion, it seemed. And for various reasons, we were not convinced that this could be the factor that was responsible for the reactive hypoglycemia. So the, the, for us, the major breakthrough that came out was the paper by Graham Bell, uh, when he actually managed to clone the sequence of hamster proglucagon. And um, so here we have the proposed structure of hamster proglucagon from this paper. And uh, this showed clearly enough that here, the glycetin molecule, precisely the one we had identified, exactly the same structure. But then there was, in addition, two additional sequences, one which was glucagon-like and another that was glucagon-like. So they were called glucagon-like peptide one and glucagon-like peptide two. And we, of course, immediately uh, looked at these two this proposed sequences and made radioimmunoassays for uh, these peptides and uh, looked for them in various gut extracts and models. So here we're looking at what we got out of our radioimmunoassays in extracts from people, uh, in, from the gut and from pancreas. <clears throat> and here you can see, that measuring this new GLP-1 thing found a large molecule in the pancreas and also using the assay for GLP-2, mainly a large molecule from the pancreas. Whereas in the extract from the gut, the assay for GLP-1 identified a much smaller molecule and for GLP-2 also a much smaller molecule in these size exclusion chromatography experiments. We could also measure their secretion using our isolated perfused organs. Here's isolated perfused pancreas, and we could stimulate it with arginine, and glucagon would come out as expected, and also GLP-1, and also GLP-2 immunoreactivity as measured with the assays. And also we could perfuse the gut, and we could stimulate the gut with bombesin that stimulates L cells, we know that now. And we could uh, use glucose also. And with the GLP-1 assay, we had a stimulation of these two things here. And with the GLP-2 assay, we could also find a stimulation. But we could also look at the molecular sizes of these molecules from the various um, perfused organs. And that's what we did here. So now we're looking at molecular sizes again. And the GLP-1 that came out of the pancreas was this large molecule again. Um, and from the gut, a much smaller molecule again and also GLP-2 from the gut was a much smaller molecule. So the conclusion of all these studies was that yes, we had a pro-glucagon molecule structure, which would look like this. And in the gut, we would have a processing to glycentin that we had already found, oxytomodulin that I showed you, and then a small molecular weight uh, uh, peptide, GLP-1 of 36 amino acids, and a GLP-2 here of 34 amino acids. And then uh, we, in the pancreas, pancreas instead, we had glucagon coming out, of course, and this large molecule that we had identified, which is now called the major proglucagon fragment, containing both of the two sequences. That was the interpretation. So now the question was, of course, what do they do, these two new peptides that we had isolated from the gut? Are they responsible for the reactive hypoglycemia? So um, we used our isolated perfused pig pancreas, which you will see lying here. It's a wonderful preparation. I love it badly. Um, it can produce a lot of, uh, of pancreatic juice, as you can see here. Um, but uh, in this case, we were looking at insulin secretion. And sadly, there was absolutely no effect of any of the two new GLP-1 molecules. But uh, we were, of course, very uh, intrigued by this and unhappy about it. So we started to look for the real, the natural GLP-1 peptide in the gut instead. Using our new assays, we could fish them out of gut extracts from humans here. And this is what we did. So this is natural, natural GLP-1 from uh, the human gut extract, where we're looking at the effects on insulin secretion here. And you can see that this peptide, the natural peptide that we could fish out was a very powerful a stimulator of insulin secretion. So this was really the news here. Now, eventually we were able to map exactly the precise structure of all these peptides. So again, you have proglucagon up here and the processing in the pancreas with the major proglucagon fragment. And all of this is due to a processing enzyme which is called prohormone convertase two. And in the gut instead, you have prohormone convertase one, three, uh, which cleaves the proglucagon molecule to glycentin, as I said, and oxygen modulin, as I said. But then GLP-1 was a truncated 
of the molecule that was predicted from the gene structure. And the GLP-2 was also slightly different. Uh, so now that we had the correct structures, we could also look at their real functions. And so here is the summarized effect of GLP-1 on insulin secretion from our perfused porcine pancreas. And you can see that if we perfuse it at low glucose, nothing happens. If we perfuse it at normal glucose levels, there's a stimulation of insulin secretion. And if we increase the glucose concentration, there's a much more powerful stimulation of secretion. So we had truly found an insulinotropic peptide from the gut. Now, that was not so exciting because uh, there were several peptides from the gut that could stimulate insulin secretion, for instance, GIP, as we talked about already. But uh, the next study here, uh, also from the perfused pancreas, showed something new. And that was that not only could it stimulate insulin secretion, it could also powerfully inhibit glucagon secretion. So these are the glucagon responses from the perfused pancreas. So this was, of course, interesting because if you think about it, in the regulation of blood glucose, if glucose rises as after a meal, then you have the pancreas releasing insulin, which will act on the liver to uh, reduce glucose production and also uh, make the body take up glucose in the, in the tissues. And if you have decreasing glucose here, then you have the pancreas releasing gluco glucagon that then stimulates glucose production in the liver and maintains normal glucose levels. So by, by having this dual activity of not only stimulating insulin secretion, but also inhibiting the uh, glucagon secretion from the pancreas, then you would have a double effect on glucose. And sure enough, if you look at it, these are what are some of the fir very first experiments we did here, where we infused synthetic GLP-1 with, uh, with the correct structure into people in physiological doses, absolutely physiological doses here, we would have a, an inhibition of glucagon secretion, as you can see here. We would have a stimulation of insulin secretion as seen here. It, is, uh, it, it has two peaks and that's because of the changes in blood glucose I will show you in a minute. And because of these two changes in insulin and glucagon, we would have a suppression, a reduction of the hepatic glucose production here, measured with a tracer technology, by about 30%, very clear reduction in the glucose production. And as a result of that, plasma glucose would start to fall. But it wouldn't fall very much because, as I told you, at low glucose, it, do it doesn't work anymore. And this is true for both glucagon and insulin, that uh, then the effect is stopped. So, so uh, there's a limit to how much it falls, just about one millimoles per liter, but that is because of this dual action on both glucagon and insulin. So now we could uh, start looking at the importance for the incretin effect uh, in these studies, and we did that. So here is a study where we looked at people again at their fasting glucose concentration, but this time we clamped it so that it didn't change at all, as in the experiment I showed you already. So now it was clamped, and at one millimolar above that, and at one millimolar above that, and that covers, of course, the normal glucose excursions during meal intake. And then we infuse them with GIP, exactly in the physiological concentrations we have after meals, and we infuse them with GLP-1, also in physio physiological concentrations. And let's have a look at what happened. So here are the insulin responses. And what it shows is that uh, the, the yellow is the glucose clamp, and here we have GIP and GLP-1, and you can see that both of these hormones stimulate insulin secretion at the fasting glucose levels, and they do that equally well if they're given in the correct concentrations that you have after the meals. If you elevate the glucose a little bit, uh, simulating a meal, then you have a much stronger effect on insulin secretion, and if you elevate the glucose even further, then you have an even stronger effect. Looking at glucagon, we had differences, of course, because uh, the yellow, that's the, that's, the, that's the glucose clamping at home. And then you have the white, that's the GIP, and the red here is the GLP-1, and you can see the inhibition of glucagon secretion at each of these infusions. So there's a big difference between the two hormones in this respect. So they were very good incretin hormones, both of them. And now we could look at these experiments with the increasing doses of glucose. So here we have GIP responses and GLP responses in controls and also in type twos, but that's a different story. And you can see that uh, if we, with a, with a small dose, you have a small release 
of TGIP and GLP-1, and with the higher doses, you have a larger release of these two hormones, and that can, of course, completely explain the increasing insulin secretion that you have in those experiments, and therefore, the, it can explain the entire increase in effect. So these two hormones are truly responsible for this. Now, a more advanced way of looking at this is to look at uh, use uh, antagonists of the receptors. And uh, here is a kind of timeline for the discoveries of the various stuff. And uh, here, uh, already in 1993, there was discovered an, an antagonist of the GLP-1 receptor, uh, Extendin 9 it's called, and it's been used for several studies. Uh, and we were able to uh, discover a new receptor for the GIP receptor in, back in 2015 for the first time. And so now that we could have receptors for both, uh, antagonists for both receptors, we could start to map the incretin system in a different way. So here is the GIP330 amide molecule, which is the G uh, GIP receptor antagonist. And it's truly a good antagonist. It has a very high affinity compared to GIP itself, as you can see in these binding experiments. It does not have any agonist properties at all. And it is a competitive uh, antagonist as seen from this shield plot. So it's a really useful antagonist. And now we could start to look at people, again, given glucose and see what happened with the antagonist. So um, the open circle here is the control experiment where people just have the glucose to drink. And then with the both of the antagonists and also the combination, we could see what happened. And the important observation here is if you block the two incretin hormones, the actions of them, you develop glucose intolerance. So you will be glucose intolerant if you do not have your incretin hormones. This might be predicted, but needed to be demonstrated, of course. And if you look at insulin secretion, that's a little bit difficult here because the glucose changes as I showed you. So here, uh, looking at this to, to evaluate this, we were looking at C-peptide uh, divided by the glucose increases uh, so that we are normalizing for glucose changes here. And if we do this, we can clearly see how the two antagonists separately inhibit insulin secretion, but particularly how they inhibit insulin secretion when they're given together. And that allows us then to analyze the incretin system in details and put some numbers on. So now we can account completely for what happens in healthy individuals. The glucose alone is responsible for 26% of the insulin secretion that you observe. And GIP is responsible for, I, I'm sorry, GIP is responsible for 45% and GLP-1 is responsible for 29% of the increase in effect. So GLP-1 is not the most important increase in hormone, but what is it good for? Let's have a look, look at something else. So uh, knowing that this was a, a glucagon-related peptide, we were started to looking for, look for food intake instead. So these were the first experiments we did in people. And you can see here that um, there's an effect of GLP-1 infusions in these people on satiety. Satiety is increased. And uh, there's also an effect on the sensation of hunger. Hunger is decreased. And as a result of that, there was also a decrease in the amount of food that they were eating at an at lib meal. So there was, a, there was a clear effect on that. And in a subsequent study, we could collect uh, all the studies that had been, uh, was appearing in those days. And here you see that the rate of infusion, the amount of GLP-1 that is infused is correlated to the decrease in energy intake. So the more you give up the hormone, the more you decrease uh, food intake. Is it also a physiological action of this hormone? Let's have a look at that. We can use the antagonist for these studies. And of course we can serve a meal and see how much they eat with and without the antagonist of GLP-1 receptor. And sure enough, if you give the antagonist, people will eat more suggesting that it has been uh, inhibiting food intake and appetite, uh, the, the normal hormone. So we think that is true. How does that work? How does that work? Could it be an effect on the stomach? Um, we don't think so because there are, there are very few direct effects of GLP-1 on the stomach. It could be central effects. It could act on the CNS because we had shown that there was access of GLP-1 to the circumventricular organs. It could be centrally produced GLP-1. That does not appear to be the case, but that's another very interesting story. 
and it could interact with sensory vagal afferents. Let me show you what we think happens. So here we have a GLP-1 cell in the small intestine in a crypt. That's the one which is stained here. And just outside it lies something red. And what is that? That's a capillary in the lamina propria. And why is it red? That's because it's been stained with an antibody against an enzyme, dipeptidyl peptidase 4. And what does that enzyme do? Well, it turns out to cleave GLP-1 molecule here uh, at this site. So two amino acids are removed. And the remaining part of the molecule is now completely inactive in terms of insulin secretion. And this happens extremely rapidly. So this is the half-life of GLP-1 in, uh, in the body, in people, and it's only about one to two minutes. And the clearance weight is ridiculously high. So this is really an extensive destruction of this very good peptide. So how, what happens here? So this diagram shows you what might happen here. We have the L cell in the virus. It's stimulated and it starts to secrete TLP1, which is in its active form. It's taken up by a capillary. Here we have the endothelial cells that express PPP4. And that means that it is destroyed. And it's so extensive that only about a quarter of what is released here survives in the intact form and moves up to the liver. In the liver, about 50% of what is um, of what is uh, uh, entering to the liver is destroyed, so that now we are back down to about 12%. In the circulation, there is also DPP4 activity that will destroy some of the circulating GLP-1, so that only about 10 or even less uh, percent of what was secreted may reach the target organs. So that's, of course, a very inefficient system. But what happens, it seems, is that it may interact with sensory afferent nerves of the vagus here in the gut. Uh, and they will then send impulses uh, to the brainstem up here. They have their cell bodies in the nodose ganglion and send projections to the nucleus of the solitary tract in the brainstem. And from here, neurons are activated that can then signal to the dorsal motor vagal complex and influence organ function in the body or send impulses to the hypothalamus and influence uh, hypothalamic function. And the question is now, is this, this could be demonstrated in experimental animals, in, in mice and, and rats. Can it also be demonstrated in humans? So to do this, we uh, looked at people that had, had truncal vagotomies done. So they had their vagus nerves cut here and um, those existed and we could find them. So we could start looking at the effects here. And what we're looking at first here is gastric emptying, which is strongly influenced by GLP-1. And in controls with intact vagus supply, you can see that this is the control, a meal emptying of a meal from the stomach. And then if you give them GLP-1, you can inhibit this emptying of the meal very strongly, as you can see here. But if you look at those that are vagotomized, they empty the meals much faster, but nevertheless, they do. But if you give them GLP-1, uh, it doesn't act work at all. So uh, this is the model we're using. And now we're looking at food intake here. So here we have the controls again, and they are given GLP-1 in an infusion. And you can see that they lower significantly their food intake by about the same amount that we saw before. But if we look at those people here uh, that are vagotomized, there's absolutely no effect on food intake any longer. So this, of course, supports this idea of the vagal transmission. If you infuse or inject GLP-1, it may also, as I said, enter the brain and the brainstem, and it can do that here at the area of the streamer. And you can see that by, by um, looking at CFOS activation of the neurons that have been hit. So this is what this shows, that if you inject a, a GLP-1 agonist, like Liraglutide, for instance, you will see the cells in the area of the streamer light up. But you can also see the activation of the cells in the nucleus of the solitary tract, which are used by the endogenous TLP1. But this is another way of entering the brain and getting effects on appetite. So if you take all of this together, you have what we in those days called the diabetologist's, the diabetologist's dream. So we have the actions of TLP1, and if we contrast them with the type two diabetic phenotype, you have impaired beta cell function, of course, you have uh, actions of GLP-1 that can, that can mitigate this in a, in a very efficient way. You have reduced beta cell mass, 
and GLP-1 actually will inhibit beta cell apoptosis. And this is probably true even in humans. You have a glucagon hyposecretion, and what GLP-1 can do is inhibit glucagon secretion. You have overeating and obesity, and you can inhibit gastric emptying and satiety and appetite, and you can decrease food intake and cause a weight loss. You have uh, fantastic effects on the cardiovascular system. I will not talk, talk about that. Uh, you have Im improvements of insulin resistance, although they're probably secondary to the improved metabolic control with this hormone. So the problem again, of course, using this new hormone is that the DPP-4 system will ruin the peptide whenever you try to give it to people, again, with this ridiculous half-life and a metabolic clearance rate that is very high. So uh, if you look here at what happens, if you inject people, again, these are type 2 diabetic individuals that were being in injected with GLP-1, this is what happens. This is the metabolite mainly, and this is what happens uh, this is the amount of GLP-1 that survives in the intact form. And you can see that it's just a few percent that survive after the injection in the intact form. So this made us think a little bit, what can we do about this? And one of the things that we suggested then was that perhaps we could inhibit this enzyme, the dipeptidyl peptidase 4, and, it, and, and, and then prevent the degradation of the new hormone and make it survive better. And that would be very similar to what has been done for the ACE inhibitors to treat hypertension, of course. So this was the inspiration. So um, what we did then was to look at pigs here uh, and do some experiments. We were infusing these pigs with GLP-1, and we did that before and after we had administered a DPP-4 inhibitor. We also gave them a little bit of glucose to stimulate insulin secretion. And what you see here is the concentrations of the intact, the active hormone before the inhibitor, and this is the metabolite, and you can see that very little survives in the intact form in spite of a continuous intravenous infusion of it. But after the inhibition, it was possible to protect completely the, DP, the, the GLP-1 peptide. So uh, this was successful, and what happened to insulin secretion? As you can see here, insulin secretion was greatly stimulated if you inhibited the degradation by GLP-1. So this really worked. And this was, of course, extremely interesting because it made people, uh, the pharmaceutical industry extremely interested. And very soon they were able to develop DPP-4 inhibitors that could be covering the 24 hours of the day. And here is one of the earliest experiments we did with Vildegliptin here. And after 28 days, we could show that the concentrations of intact GLP-1, they were truly uh, increased by the DPP-4 inhibitor at two meals here over the day. And GIP was actually also protected because it's also sensitive to DPP-4. And as shown here, the glucagon concentrations were inhibited. So it really, really worked. Oops, I'm sorry. Uh, and here we have um, a clinical study co conducted by Dr. Bo Aaron, uh, where he looked at, uh, again, it's Vildegliptin for the first time in a, in a real clinical study here. Uh, where it was given to people for a year. And here we have the placebo group, and you can see these are increases in hemoglobin A1C, long-term glucose control. And here you can see the result of the DPP-4 inhibitor with a very nice and, and sustained uh, suppression of the long-term glucose. So it really worked and became a tremendous success. The uh, GLP-1 molecule itself could, of course, also be used to treat diabetes, and we've done that in various, uh, in various uh, experiments. But um, to be really successful, uh, you needed to uh, make it stable, to stabilize the molecule against the actions of, of, of DPP-4, and this was done by substitutions in this position too. Uh, but that's not enough to prevent the elimination in the kidneys. So various attempts was done to solve this problem. And there are now quite a number of human GLP-1 analogs out there. And I've had the pleasure and, and privilege of, of working together with people on developing some of these, uh, some of the most successful of them. And that has been extremely exciting and a great pleasure for me. Um, but uh, let me just end up by telling that uh, these uh, are today extremely efficacious. And I'll show you with this simple slide here, that shows the effects in one of the clinical studies with uh, tirosepatite, it's called from the Lilly Company. It is uh, a combined GIP and GLP-1 agonist, co-agonist, 
um, no, most of the activity is probably due to GLP-1. And what it shows here is that this long-term glucose control is decreased in more than 50% of the individuals at this dosing here, uh, down to levels of less than 5.7%. Now, this is important because 5.7%, that is normal. And that means that you can normalize glucose levels in these people with type 2 diabetes with these compounds. That is diabetes remission. And that's the most efficacious result that's ever seen in diabetes therapy so far. In addition, these uh, compounds also lower body weight. And here is a 12.4% uh, weight change in these individuals with type 2 diabetes, which is a very good result also. So um, let's conclude by saying that the GLP-1, it has some very important physiological actions, which include that it is a second in line incretin hormone, but perhaps even more important, it's an inhibitor of appetite and food intake. And we found that inhibition of this enzyme DP4 could rescue the endogenous GLP-1 hormone and enhance its anti-diabetic actions. And this of course has been uh, the result of um, or the, the, the background for the use of the DPP-4 inhibitors. The long-acting GLP-1 analogs are now the most effective anti-diabetic drugs in terms of type 2 diabetes. They are also the most powerful anti-obesity drugs known, and this is a new development which is uh, about to change the therapy and approach to treating obesity. And they also have been demonstrated to protect the cardiovascular system and prevent stroke which is really uh, the most promising thing of all. Let me just uh, mention that uh, it, we actually were able to demonstrate that the gut peptide GLP-1 was responsible for the reactive hypoglycemia that we saw in the patients, the surgical patients that we had. Uh, it took about 20 years to find it out, but we managed to find out. So with this, I will end my talk and I thank you very much for attending. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Holst, for telling us the inspiring story of your profoundly impactful work. I know that many of you in the audience will have questions for Dr. Holst. Please pose them in the Q&A function at any time, and we will hold our joint question and answer session following our second speaker, who I now have the pleasure of introducing. Dr. Patty Garcia, is a member of the Gairdner Global Health Award Adjudication Committee, and she's joining us from Lima, Peru today. Dr. Garcia is professor at the Universidad Peruana Cayetano Heredia and adjunct professor in the Department of Global Health at the University of Washington. She is the former Minister of Health of Peru Dean of the School of Public Health at the University of Peru and former chief of the Peruvian National Institute of Health. Dr. Garcia is recognized as a leader in global health. Her research in global health is in the areas of reproductive health, STI, HIV, HPV, and medical informatics. She has recently been appointed member of the United States National Academy of Medicine, becoming the first Peruvian professional with such a distinction. Dr. Garcia's talk this morning is titled, Public Health in Peru, From Research into Policy and Action. Dr. Garcia. Well, thank you so much for the invitation to participate in the Gardner Virtual Lecture at York University. It is really an honor and a pleasure. And so now let's start. So health issues in this 21st century are complex for the whole world. Finally, we have recognized that globally we share vulnerabilities. Populations are growing and getting older causing demographic changes that is causing a shift in diseases, an epidemiological transition from infectious to non-communicable diseases, creating especially in low middle income countries, a double burden. And pandemic threats are now a reality. Climate change, 
humanitarian crisis and civil conflicts, the burden of mental disorders, which is a major global public health problem that affects patients, society, and nations. Everything in an interconnected world with global travel and incredibly fast information flow, which could be good, but can also spread myths, fears, and bad practices, like the infodemia we have seen during this pandemic. Adding to that, the social pressure and the technological pressure this one bringing new technologies, which are certainly good, but often too expensive or do not do what they promise or do not address the problems that are the most pressing globally because they may be least profitable. And so the challenge is how do we adapt health systems to promote prevention, ensure access and care and be resilient. And for that, we need investments in research and innovation and those should be taken into policy and action, which is easier to say than to do. And for that, we need implementation research, we need collaboration, catalytic funds, and we need to share solutions. I come from Latin America, a region that despite significant social and economic changes over the past 50 years, remains the most unequal region in the world in economic terms. Indeed, the Latin American region is 19% more unequal than Sub-Saharan Africa, 37% more unequal than East Asia, and 65% more unequal than developed countries. Inequalities affect the distribution of resources and social opportunities, causing high levels of poverty, deterioration of the environment, blocks the development of human capital, causes institutional weakness and corruption. And all those things affect health. And during this pandemic, my region, Latin America, has been hit very hard due to those inequities. And this is Peru, where I come from, one of the most unequal countries in Latin America, not only in economic terms, but also social, ethnic, and culturally. We are 32 million people, and we have three very different regions, the coast, which is a desert, the Andean region, and the jungle, which is the rainforest, which complicate even more any public health approach. I trained as a doctor and at some point I saw the light and um, I started working in public health where you can help hundreds of thousands of people with one adequate and well implemented strategy. I started to work in implementation research and my passion is to try to improve things to introduce evidence-based approaches and innovation in the public sector, which in Peru cares for more than 92% of the population. Throughout my life, I have been jumping between academia and governmental positions, which has allowed me to understand the importance of creating bridges between both sectors and how critical it is to go from research into policy and action, but also to understand the challenges from both sides and how effectively address them uh, most of the times. And today, I just want to share some examples of the research we have been doing and how it has become policy. So I trained in infectious diseases and epidemiology at the University of Washington during the beginning of the HIV pandemic, when sexually transmitted diseases, STDs, or sexually transmitted infections, STIs, also became very popular. There, somebody asked me about Peru and about STIs. And actually, I thought, mm, I have no idea. Aren't Peruvians having sex? I have never seen a patient with a sexually transmitted disease at any of the health centers where I work during my medical training in Peru. So I wondered, are there any STDs in, or STIs in Peru? And where do people go when they have them? To answer the first question, what we decided to do is we started doing research. And yes, there are STIs in Peru and people have sex. Young people have them, people in rural areas too, and sex with female sex workers is common and they had a high rate of STIs, although they were supposedly going to health governmental programs, which are not that good. For the second question, where do people go with STIs? I did what anybody will do in Lima if you need some information. I asked a taxi driver and he told me, senorita, for a venereal disease, you have to go to the pharmacy. And actually, 
They come in different sizes and colors and they are everywhere. They are available, open, inexpensive, and there are more pharmacies than health centers. Pharmacies do not need pharmacists working on them. Most of the pharmacy workers do not have any professional degree. Plus, in developing countries, self-medication is quite common and is more common in people with less resources. Pharmacy workers are considered non-traditional providers. And these individuals are part of the community. They are close, in close contact with people and they are addressing in their own way the issues related to the health of the individuals in their communities as part of their regular business. They have the potential of benefit if their actions are correct, but they are not considered yet part of the public health system, but they need to be engaged in our global public health responses um, to confront these 21st century challenges. So we started to investigate pharmacies and STDs. And we found that people with STDs, yes, they go to the pharmacies. And we also found that the management of STDs was poor by private physicians or physicians in private practice and by pharmacies. And by the way, pharmacies, pharmacy workers learn how to handle STIs from the prescriptions of the physicians in private practice. And we learned also that the STD rates in clients at pharmacies were similar to the STD rates at STD clinics of other countries. And we realized the importance of doing something that will involve the pharmacies in order to control STDs. Uh, but not only that, um, we were able to quantify that for one patient that goes to a public health center, 10 were going to private physicians and 100 were seen at pharmacies. And then we have this idea of creating an intervention model that will include pharmacies, clinicians, health centers, and to evaluate this through a randomized control trial, which was funded through Welcome, the Wellcome Trust Foundation. Actually, this was this urban community randomized trial of a multi-component STI prevention intervention. There were four actions that we were going to take or four interventions. Having a mobile team that will go and find those female sex workers that are hard to reach, do screening treatment of STIs and will give condoms and will promote them. The second was to create a network. We call it the Red Preven, which means the network for prevention in which pharmacies will be linked to health centers and clinicians and we will strengthen their capacities to recognize STDs and manage them. And we also needed some social marketing of condoms, availability of treatment and a health communication campaign. And actually we thought big. This was a nationwide randomized trial in which we included the 20 cities, the 20 biggest cities in Peru in the three regions. And randomly we assigned some of them to the intervention arm and some to the control arm. The outcomes were measured through the general population survey in each of these 20 cities and with, in, with female sex workers surveys after two to three years of the intervention. And of course, we end up having lots of papers, papers in the Lancet, but most importantly, we started to understand what was going on with STIs in the country. We learned that um, there are different risk groups women from a general population. There are women that are not in commercial sex venues, but consider themselves female sex workers, men having sex with men, are clients of female sex workers, and each of them will have different rates of STIs. But most importantly, um, the randomized trial was showed that this multi-component intervention was effective. Significantly, we reduced the prevalence of STDs in female sex workers and in women from general population. And, because we were working also, and we involved from the very beginning, the National STD HIV program, strategies were implemented as part of the program and has guided actions in other Latin American countries. Well, then we saw the need to start working on medical informatics and the introduction of digital health in Peru, as well as the introduction of other types of innovations like new diagnostics or point of care tests. For that, we applied for funding from a program called Mobile Citizen from the Inter-American Bank of Development. Actually, uh, we proposed this project called Guagua Red. Guagua is a Quechua word. Quechua is the language the people talks in the Andean region. And Guagua means baby and red network. So how can we connect for improving the maternal health and child health? 
And um, our aim was to create an electronic medical record for antenatal care that could be linked secure to a database, but also to a portal. Plus, that could be simple for the provider. So we were basing everything on this important, the importance of the user in the center. And actually we asked them and what, they, what the providers wanted is to enter the data once, but use it multiple times, because in general, they have to fill out more than 30 different paper forms as part of administrative work every time they see a pregnant women, and most of the data is repeated. But the other thing that they wanted is they wanted to have some type of connection, continuous connection with the women. So we added these personalized text messages to their cell phones. And we asked providers and women, how did they want those messages? Providers wanted reminders of the appointments and health and, and um, some healthcare recommendations. And the women wanted nutritional advice, motivation, motivational messages, and they wanted not to feel lonely. So we performed this randomized trial and um, we show an increase, a significant increase on the number of visits to antenatal care and to the antenatal care on time. However, the effect was greater in women with secondary education. You know why? Because they were able to read the messages and understand them. So we thought, well, what if we start giving them voice messages? So with funding from the IDRC from Canada, we added to the system a voice messaging and perform a randomized trial and also a cost effectiveness analysis. Um, the voice messages were sent in Spanish and or Quechua at the choice of the user. And we did this in the rural area. We had a component of a qualitative research and of course the randomized trial. I mean, this is one of the testimonies of the women from this area, which I mean, was very compelling. When we were called me, I felt it was as if my mother was calling me and giving advice. And all the results, as you can see here, show that these voice messages had an impact on the things that we were very concerned about, women going to the antenatal care visits, postpartum controls, taking what they were recommended, the iron, etc. And so working with the Ministry of Health in 2017, uh, we gave them the whole platform of what we read and it became a national policy and they started the national implementation of this electronic medical record and so far there are 1200 health establishments at the primary level that are using it back again on sexually transmitted diseases and linking it with better antenatal care services we started the introduction introduction of point of care tests that could help in the aim of elimination of congenital syphilis. Point of care tests are those that the provider, the person seeing the patient in their own office can do in front of the patient so you can save time and you can empower also the providers. Here you can see a midwife um, that is seeing a pregnant woman. These are professional midwives that in primary health centers are seeing women. So in Peru, maternal syphilis used to be 20 times higher than HIV, with a rate of about 1%. And in women having a spontaneous abortions with quotation marks, a, the prevalence are as high as 9%. Just in case abortions are illegal in Peru, but most of them are considered spontaneous by practitioners to avoid legal problems. So the other problem was that um, although the screening is for free, at any antenatal care clinic from the Ministry of Health, the coverages of screening were very low. And that had to do with complicated processes, lack of laboratory supplies, equipment required for the RPR, which is the test that is being used, and the motivation of the providers. I mean, as part of this exploration, we ask, I mean, do you, what do you think about syphilis? And everybody thought that syphilis was gone. So our question was, can the introduction of a point of care test a rapid syphilis test catalyze improvements in the system. There was this rapid test that WHO had already pre-qualified but nobody was using. So we decided to see if we could improve the coverage on syphilis screening in different services, improve the coverage of treatment of those that are positive and their partners, and also improve the system per se. And we decided to evaluate the performance and do some cost effect cost-benefit ratios, and if this work in this feasibility study, try to do transferences and scale up. So 
Um, one interesting thing is that as part of the exploration, we asked pregnant women if they knew about syphilis. So most of them knew about HIV, but they didn't know about syphilis. And when we tell them the story that this is a disease that they can have without knowing, that they can pass it to the baby and the baby can be very sick, can have malformations, can die. But if they, the women are screened and get treatment they, on time, the baby could be beautiful and born healthy. They said, wow, it's like the story of the ugly duckling. So you can go from the ugly duckling into the swan. And, so, and they suggested that we should call this project, Project Cisne. Cisne is the Spanish word for swan. So meetings for involvement, understanding the needs, understanding facilitators are barriers, baseline assessments. And one thing that was quite important was to identify champions at all levels, from the field workers, the workers at the health centers, all the way to the authorities. And we started the training and implementation in three in four services, antenatal care, delivery and emergency, and in the abortion miscarriage services, which are the forgotten one. And in a year, we were able to screen more than 20,000 women. So just to show you, this is this was how it, the system was. Women, for just to complete their first antenatal care, they had to go six different times because everything was fragmented. Um, it took almost 27 days. And the screening results were not always available. Introducing the new test, we catalyzed the change. With this rapid test, we could have the results in 20 minutes at the, and the treatment the same day. And uh, of course, we increased the screening, increased the treatment um, rates, but also we improved the flows, the timing, and the quality of service in antenatal care. Um, this is published, and the study was a success. The Ministry of Health the next year launched the campaign Yes to Life, Not to Syphilis. Um, they bought about 300 tests, 300,000 tests, which was one third of what we needed. So we continue helping on, the, on writing the national guidelines, training, and then we find out what one of the bottlenecks was the procurement of the tests. Understanding that it was too fragmented, we were able to, working with them, um, be able to establish a centralized procurement and buying it through the procurement system of UNICEF at half a dollar a test. But the HIV tests had a very different procurement system. Every single health center was buying them. So what we saw is that the screening for syphilis increased and we were decreasing the rates, but the screening for HIV was not increasing, but technology could help, right? So looking around, ah, this new technology came out in which we could have in one cassette, two tests, syphilis and HIV. We try it, we validate it, we work with providers and in 2017, it was implemented in Peru at all primary care centers and as still is working. So I have been working on different research projects aiming to strengthen the capacities of the health sector, improving quality services, introducing technologies, but also because I think it's quite important empowering individuals and communities to improve screening coverage and promote equity. And one of these projects is called HOPE empowering women, uh, and it involves community health agents that promote molecular self-sampling for a screening of human papillomavirus. In Peru, every five hours, a woman dies from cervical cancer. Although we already have HPV vaccination that is only for girls 10 years old, and we are pushing to have relatively good coverage. However, there are several cohorts of women that are already infected. And we know that if a woman is infected with HPV, the risk of cervical cancer is much higher. And that is why uh, we thought about this new model for cervical cancer prevention using technology and promoting the culture of cervical cancer prevention. Uh, we applied to Grand Challenges Canada and we got funded. So the idea was identify women from the community that could become champions, train them, providing them the information about cervical cancer and providing them these simple screening tests. And they could teach other women how to do the self-sampling for HPV at home. And then we thought that it was important for women to be able to go to a place 
when they have time to leave their samples. So we put these collection boxes, like the blockbuster collection boxes for videos. I mean, maybe you're too young to remember that, but it's like, it's there, you just put it and forget it. And then we had a system to collect everything and we have a lab at the health center that will process the, sen the samples. And then we will send the results by cell phone and reminders if they needed an appointment because they were positive. And we hope that our final result were healthy women, early detection and better prognosis. So um, we got the funding and we started this, again, a feasibility study to start with. So we did it in Ventanilla, Callao, which is in the middle of the desert because the coast is a desert, 30 minutes from the Lima airport. So if you have ever come to Lima, if you go to the right, you come to Miraflores, which is a beautiful place that looks like Europe. And if you go to the left, you find Ventanilla. So we went and started identifying potential women champions in the streets, in the markets, in the schools, everywhere. Um, if they would like to learn about cervical cancer and help other women, we have lots of volunteers. We started training these women champions. We have these sessions of two days workshop and we show them this is a screening kit. So it's a, a, an envelope. We have this tube with a barcoding and we have this small brush and they learn how to do self-collection of samples. They were the first ones to have them and they learned about cervical cancer. But they were learning also how to have better communication with other women. And this idea came out, how can we reach more women? And one place where women talk with other women are in the market. So they said, yeah, we need something like a bag. And we started to design together a bag that will help them to have the kids, but also to start the interaction. And we create this bag. This bag can be open. And when you open it, swa. This is how you see inside. So you can show women because several women don't know how they look from the outside or the inside. You can explain them in the middle of the market and tell them how to do the self-sampling. Became very popular with it role-playing and the best ones were certified as our community health agents, completely volunteer, no payment or hope ladies. So we have the collection sites, as I told you, at night women was going to leave their samples. We had a motorcycle that we're collecting these different stations where women could leave their samples and take it to the central place. And we had these results that were given automatically through SMS messages and WhatsApp. So what did we learn with this study? Well, first we document the prevalence of HPV that was around 12.5%, 15% in other places. So very similar to other parts of the world, maybe in the high range. But the most important thing is that we were able to really improve the coverage of a screening because two thirds of the women that we reach have never had before a pap smear. Women love cell sampling, they love the collection sites, they love technology. And in 2017, working with the national, with the Ministry of Health also, uh, new national guidelines in Peru, it started to include cervical cancer screening with HPV molecular testing for the very first time and self-sampling. We had a new plan for control of cervical cancer and although things had been moving slowly, they are there. But, and well, the pandemic came in the middle, but anyway, one thing that we learned also is that it's not only enough to do the screening, we need to assure the treatment of HPV positive women. And we have a scarcity of professionals, gynecologists, outside Lima, which is the capital city and has one third of a population of whole Peru. So with funding from USAID, we have started, just started a new model to see and treat at primary level using new technologies like the pocket colposcope um, to do telecolposcopy, which means that the provider, um, the midwife or a nurse can do the colposcopy, but has somebody with more experience that will be checking far away, like I'm giving you the talk, and then using thermocoagulation. And we're trying this in an Andean um, region, which is called Cajamarca. And the other thing that we wanted is in the meantime, also assuring that there is some funding. So we applied again to One Challenges Canada for this model, this social business model in which because women are interested on having this type of technology, which is not available even in the private, in the private sector easily and at this low cost. So we change how the package look. You can see the, the little uh, box there. And so we offer in the retail sector, the commercial sector to women that can pay, they can receive this as a delivery and um, they take the sample, we collect it, 
we process, we send them the results, and we give them also recommendations of physicians that are already trained by us on how to manage HPV. And for each um, kit that a woman will buy, uh, that will help us to train more Hope ladies that will receive an incentive for every test they distribute um, among women that don't have resources. So that's a social component. And actually our motto is buy one and save two lives. And in 2020, we'll receive an award for MAFRE for social innovation. So wrapping up, I have even examples of how to go to policy or research into policy and action. So all players that, be, that started having new roles than like the pharmacy workers that can be allies for global public health. How new technologies can become catalytic to improve the services. Only if you know, if you understand what is going on and you try to make this work better. And the other thing is, it is important to start thinking nowadays about user initiated interventions, meaning empowering the public. In this case, with HOPE, we empower women to help other women. So those are the HOPE ladies, the community health agents. And also we empower women to take their health in their hands. Women are sometimes are scared to go to health centers because they are exposed with the physical examination. They hate, they call it the duck to the speculum, but they are willing to do the self-collection of samples and they listen to other women. So why do we think we were able to go from research to policy and action? This is, these are my top 10. First of all, it's quite important to engage stakeholders and people as peers from the beginning and during all the study phases, even from the idea. And they could give you ideas of what is not working and how could you help with research for that. And they have to honor the agenda. You have to dissipate tensions between providers because everybody is afraid of losing their job. Or, and, and if you have a baseline um, assessment that shows that everything is bad, uh, they are concerned. So you have to meet, discuss, and also identify champions. You have to train according to the needs. And for that, you need to understand what are the needs. And you have to guide your training by information that you have on the baseline and follow up information. You have to provide monitoring, support, and recognition. At some point, you know, and recognition is not money. We were given recognition as, as these certificates that we made in paper. So we have a, a copper paper, a silver paper, a golden paper and a platinum paper, depending on who was doing better on the different actions. And it was a recognition and you could see them, these uh, certificates in the health centers. You have to share results and discuss actions together. You have to consult and get feedback from the users. And the users are the community, the providers, and it, the policymakers too. I mean, they need to, you need their feedback. Use simple but compelling messages, okay? Syphilis is 20 times more frequent than HIV. HIV is important, syphilis too. Or one woman dies every five hours because of cervical cancer in Peru. Involve other partners, NGOs, agencies, and community. Have user-friendly cost-effectiveness analysis because policymakers need to have the numbers. And the, one of the most important person to make things happen usually is the Ministry of Finance and they like numbers. And finally, but very important, keep motivation high in your team and all the people that are around because changes take time. And I think this is something that we have to explain very well, the funders. So we have to address the 21st century challenges. My career in research has taught me that adaptation which is what we need, will require innovation and new significant changes from the responses global public health have utilized in the past. Research should be guided by the needs and collaboration and partnerships are key issues. And research results should guide policies for maximum public health impact. I just want to finish leaving you with these two thoughts. One from a German poet that probably you know, Von Goethe, and one from a Peruvian poet that I'm introducing to you, Cesar Vallejo. So get said, knowing is not enough, we must apply. Willing enough is not enough, we must do. And Vallejo said, there is sisters and brothers still very much to do. Thank you so much.
Okay, thank you very much. We don't have a lot of time, but we do have time for a few questions that have been uh, provided in the chat. So uh, if there are more, and what we will try to do if we don't have much time uh, is make sure that we provide the questions to the speakers and uh, if they would be willing, possibly they could answer them by email. So initially, um, question for Dr. Holst uh, from John Paul Pelusi. Thank you, Dr. Holst for that fascinating talk. While the DPP4 inhibitors have shown to be effective, are small molecule peptidomimetics a possibility to achieve a similar outcome? And could that be a more cost effective audience? Uh, sorry, option. Yeah, so <clears throat> that's a very good question. Uh, that has been tried, and I've also been active myself in this field. And uh, many, many companies have also tried to develop small molecules uh, that would be orally available. Um, and unfortunately, for some reason, this uh, these uh, peptides that act on the GPGRB1 system, they are very, very difficult to, uh, for those it's very, very difficult to produce small molecule agonists. You can, you can develop antagonists, but not agonists. They seem to have bell-shaped curves and they behave very badly. So it, it has not been possible really. There are a few out there, but they have not been successful. Um, uh, fortunately, it has now been possible to uh, produce a, uh, an orally available GLP-1 agonist, and it's out there. Um, uh, it, is, uh, it has a, a terrible bioavailability, as you might predict, but, uh, but uh, it's possible to do it anyway. Um, so so that's, that's the new development, and, and, and I'm sure you are right, it's not a cost-effective solution at all. Uh, uh, so it would be a, a great thing, but it hasn't been possible so far. Okay, a question for Dr. Garcia from George Zoidal. Um, what is the role of traditional medicine in Peru as it is one of the pillars to tackle STDs? Thank you so much for that question. So we explore um, this issue of the chamanes or, uh, or traditional healers for STDs. But actually, you know, most of the STDs are more urban than rural, and you can see this traditional medicine more in rural areas. Uh, so the reality is that their, their part of importance in STD is very little, okay? However, traditional healers are quite important, for example, in areas that had to do with reproductive health, with... Um, and, and, and issues of how can we decrease maternal mortality? And they have been involved in other actions that I haven't talked, like for example, the promotion of um, the linkages between these traditional healers and our health centers by introducing vertical delivery in, in health centers. And the other area that is also quite interesting to introduce traditional healers together with pharmacies is on the early detection of tuberculosis and try to link patients that are symptomatic to treatment. But um, so I, what happened in Latin America is that we are becoming in general, most of our, our countries are becoming more urban and uh, these issues of traditional medicine are more located in rural areas. So for STDs, they have a very small um, importance for HIV in the jungle area, some traditional healers are being um, uh, trained also on the issues of decreased transmission and the importance of antiretroviral therapy. And they have been key elements to try to link these faraway communities into uh, linkages to treatment. Okay, one final, uh, hopefully quick, question and answer is we are running out of time uh, from Michael Riddell. What an incredible presentation, Dr. Holst. I wonder if GLP-1 antagonists have been tested to treat people who might have reactive hypoglycemia. The topic that was the inspiration for all this incredible work 
that ended up developing GLP-1 agonists and DPP-4 antagonists to treat type 2 diabetes. Thank you very much for that question. Um, so that's, the fact is that it has been tried and it does work and I'm, we've ourselves contributed a number of times. So the Xentin 9 molecule is now being developed for treating uh, hypoglycemia after bariatric surgery, which, which is where we have a lot of those uh, 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 cases. And it, it seems to work very nicely. So, yes. Okay, so I think um, we are pretty much out of time. So over to... Jennifer again for a final few words and a few of us will be joining us in some additional sessions to follow. Jennifer. Thank you to both of our distinguished speakers and our audience who joined us today. I'd also like to once again thank our sponsors without whom an event like this could not take place. The Globe and Mail, the Government of Canada, CIHR and York University. Finally, I'd like to thank everyone who worked behind the scenes to help put this event together. And as Dr. Perlman mentioned, for those who are invited to the small breakout sessions with our speakers, please join us on those Zoom links at this time. Thank you again to everyone. This closes our session.